Hello and welcome to the third edition of Fleetcast reviewing Star Trek the Animated Series. We are the third or the fourth? I believe this is the fourth. Fourth. Seven and eight. This is the fourth now. Because the because the, the third was when we covered More Tribbles, More Troubles. Oh, Great yeah. episode. It's been And so the funny. Survivor. The most annoying episode. Yes, the one that's made me have all the flags. But it's been so long. It's been what a month since we've. It's about yes, it has. It's been about a month, so I, I think I've I think I've gotten. But yes, this is episode four of us reviewing Star Trek: The Animated Series. But yep. I've been looking. We are actually halfway through season one now, aren't we? With this, because we this are. There's only sixteen episodes in this series, so we are already yep. halfway through. I'm a little bit sad about that because I've actually really enjoyed. Yeah, watching these episodes, I've enjoyed them a lot. I've enjoyed them a lot more than I did watching the original series episodes. I, I think if you go back to the to the original series now, mm -hmm. you'll like it more because honestly, TAS is kind of a greatest hits of TOS. Yeah, I think I've I've heard and, other people describe it as that. Yeah, and. Actually, the episode we're going to start in on is kind of one of those where, is it the best episode of TAS? No, it's not yesteryear. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, but is it a good episode? Yeah. I think so. Yes. yes. Um, and it's got one of those things where technically TAS was not in canon for a very long time. But it is where continuity in Star Trek starts. Thankfully. <laughs> yes. Thankfully. So we've already seen, you know, the return of the Tribbles. Yes. We've already seen um, Bob Jones from one of our planets is missing. Yes. We've seen, you know, references to these things. And this one actually gets into something a little bit deeper. Yes. This one... This one, actually, this is the Infinite Vulcan. Yes. Originally written by Walter Koenig. Yes. Uh, for those who are not good with names, Walter Koenig portrayed Mr. Chekhov. He was also Bester on on Babylon Five, and he's been in a bunch of other things too. He's a great actor. Yes. Uh, but. Unfortunately, while this episode carries his credit, it would be just as accurate to say that Gene Roddenberry wrote this episode. Um, as Gene, Majel, Walt, and a couple of others have all come out and said, there were basically ten revisions of this script before it came to screen. And the core of the idea came from Walter Koenig, but a couple of the details, a couple of the very important details yeah. came from Roddenberry and his team. Yeah. Um, one thing that I find it interesting is that this episode does get into the eugenics wars, and that's kind of a spoiler, but yes. yeah. Yes, that was that was a moment I was like, ha, I know what that is. Um, yep. but yeah, jumping ahead, that I think, like you said, this is where we start having all our ducks in a row with Star Trek and its lore, mm -hmm. very much they they hark back to a lot of things in the animated yes. series that I've seen so far. You know, Eugenics War, yes. Amanda Grayson, um, you know, all of these things I think yes. are very important and they do lay the stones for a lot of the stuff going forward. And I really, really enjoy this. So I beg anyone who has been on the same hill as me to climb down that hill um, and actually watch the animated series because it's been yeah. an absolute pleasure journey. It's it's not quite as a hard graft as the animated series, but yes, so, as originally, yes, yeah. yes. See, so, I I find them to be good companion series. But so hopping into this one, um, we go down to a planet, and it's an idyllic world, but where's the intelligent life? Yes. Wait, there's a city over there, they yeah. say. Wait. Let's go look at it. 
yeah and i was like did they not want to stop and actually think for a second no 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 they are just gonna waltz over there and they find this little purple alien um i'm gonna yes. see the purple alien on the screen but you've got some facts about this purple little alien yes this little purple alien this walking plant that stings sulu with poison is called the retlaw plant in other words walter backwards it's one of his few references that got left in the episode and in fact was a lot more pivotal in some of the original scripts because part of this episode was going to involve both sulu and spock getting affected by it okay and that was how we would get into sort of act two yeah yeah but, it, but obviously- now we meet this purple alien and mm-hmm. it, it kind of poisons Sulu. Yep. Um, and yep. I find this scene really kind of slightly confusing for me in the character of Bones because he doesn't react how I feel like he has reacted to previous situations. There's very much, I, do, I don't want to say he's kind of cool and calm, but it kind of he kind of feels very distanced. From from the situation. Well, there are a couple of these where I really wonder what state DeForest Kelly was in at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of those. But uh, I don't mind McCoy being more professional. Because remember, the last time that he tried to do something to Sulu on an emergency situation... We got the city on the edge of forever. Really? It's all the way back then? Yeah, at least on screen that we had an emergency situation. Okay. So... It just, it just kind of struck me as it it kind of didn't feel like Bones that I've mm-hmm. known, um, you know, from the okay. movies or from what the episodes that I've seen of the original series and I was a bit like, oh, I don't know I don't know how the, I don't know how this works. And then we kind of get the other aliens. Yeah. We kind of get the, yes. you know, get the other aliens. And I really like these aliens and how they kind of they they kind of look. Um I'm putting them up on the screen. Well yes, the Philosians uh Roddenberry's biggest contribution to the episode, for better or worse. Uh, were they were not originally part of the spec script? Oh, okay. And I think they only came in in like draft two. Um. So yes, we we end up with the Philosians, who look like giant artichokes. Yeah, to me. yeah, yeah. But I think the imagery is absolutely beautiful, and I don't think. We've seen yeah. that since that we've seen an alien that's basically a plant, and I really no. kind of like this lore. That's, that's one of the few things I do like about them. Um, I mean, there are a couple of little details, but I'm not upset that they haven't shown up again. Yeah, yeah. I just um, I kind of just like the imagery of it and how yeah. they. I feel very much like. The animated series, and I know I've said this before, it's very much thinking outside the box. It's very much doing the things that the original series couldn't do because of restrictions. That's exactly the point, yep. Just so good. And I I really just love the imagery and the fact that we have these aliens and they actually save the day. Um, You know, in respect of they save Sulu. Um, They heal Sulu and then, yeah, it's just kind of, it's, it's not what we normally get from aliens that that look like you know they they look very much like they they could be the bad guys which is a spoiler um but yeah. at this point they're very um they're very given they're very good you know you kind of i don't see them as bad guys even later on mm-hmm. but we'll get into that yes, they're, yes they're not bad they're misguided and ignorant yes yes and obviously okay uh, um, they kind of lead them inside to um, a yes. cabin, which is another great image that, like the imagery and what they're able to do with oh, yeah. the, 
the, the animation is just amazing and then yeah. we get my favorite thing to come out of this episode other than something later on is the purple flying plant alien oh yes those or, guys yes or, as i refer to them plants pterodactyls in my name that's very much what they are yes yes um and for or, anyone who's looking at this you might have got a sneak peek uh, earlier on green. Um, but yes, these are basically plant pterodactyls, and I love them, and yeah. I I want the teddy that is that, because I can imagine uh, that I could just yes. have it, and it's wings, and I could wrap it around me, and it would be snuggly. Yes, and have those tentacles bouncing behind you, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, it would be, it would yes. be fun. It would be, it would be such a good thing. Why does Trek not do better um, merchandise? Seriously, I have a friend who, who has Ask been... Paramount. Who has been to the Paramount store, and he had all this money to, to blow... And all he right. bought was a pen, because there is literally nothing. You know, you'd think in the sixtieth year, sixtieth year of Star Trek. Yeah. Which I think it was it was last year, wasn't it? Uh sixty six. No, sixtieth year is twenty twenty six. Okay. Fiftieth so year was twenty sixteen. It must have been the fiftieth. Must must have been fifty fifty. 50, 50th fifth year um yeah and it was it was one of the ones where they one of the years where they've made a big event and he went to yes and there was just nothing i think i literally nothing. think he either bought a pen or a pencil it was ridiculous i was like eh? yeah so no, I, I mean they don't even sell the, the best model kits anymore yeah so i was good good was his name he he runs the track up north podcast and this is this nice. is like what where he went and he was just disappointed because it was just nothing I'm yeah. It's kind of an upsetting thing, uh, where I mean, part of the reason for it is CBS isn't interested in the merchandising, and also because they license it out. Yeah. So you know, back in the '90s, we had Simon and Schuster handling so much of that. Yeah. Random House, Pocketbooks, blah blah blah. Uh, we also had the ship designs that were partly owned by Franz Joseph Designs. Yeah. Um, and then got used in Starfleet Battles. We have the models that came out of that. We have the AMT ERTL sets. We have other model sets, but yeah, not not a lot of merch out of Trek, unfortunately. It's just, it's just, and there's a lot more that we could have. There is so much more that we could have, and it just it disappoints me because other other fandoms get it so right. You've got Doctor Who. There are just there right. are books. There's books. There's there's you know there's there's clothing. Well, there's... Rick has more books than any of them, so mm? we do outnumber even Star Wars in terms of novels. Yeah, but you know, like other things, like the, books is probably yeah. the only thing that we outnumber people uh, other fandoms on. Yeah. Like you've got Star Wars, that everything. Well, there are so much coming yeah. out of Star Wars. I mean, we did have the ori we did have models well before Star Wars did. Yeah. That's one good thing. Yeah. But um. Nowadays. It's that it's dried up recently because with all the stuff with again Paramount, CBS, Viacom, blah 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 blah, blah yeah. licensing rights. Who has this? Who doesn't? It's just sad. It's just sad because there was so much potential yeah. with serious like prodigy yeah. to bring out a kids line. Like right, I would have bought all. And the now they're trying to. For my and now they're trying to completely memory hole. Yeah. Prodigy. Netflix. Netflix. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if if it's still on Netflix US. Oh, it's I but, don't know I don't know if it is, but I know it's on the UK and pretty okay. I, I'm pretty sure it's on like the European ones. And um, I know that it can be accessed via torrents. Yeah, but we're, we're not going to encourage too many people to have to sell the pirate seas today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're not going to uh, like, oh good i don't have that flag up behind me <laughs> we're not have sailing on the pirate seas today but yes so obviously we have the uh purple pterodactyls who still yes. spock away um I believe they are called screamers i i was looking at the production stuff that's on my dvds and i think they're called screamers i don't remember yeah um yeah they they're they're great though and they make a great villain. Yes. And actually the funny thing is and I realized it later. Um yes they'll return in a couple of episodes. Not the plant ones but same basic model. Okay. 
this is another connection to the Godzilla series that Filmation was doing at the same time. Because those purple pterodactyls, the same basic model, was used as an enemy for Godzilla. Okay. And also, I think it may be the base model for Rodan. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But it's... Really don't you know, know. Because Filmation liked to have limited animation and liked to reuse models as often as possible. Yeah. So, yeah. Star Trek probably got the most love out of any of their shows, even more than Godzilla did. Um, so the one thing that I kind of noticed that I'll admit, because of when I was watching this episode and stuff that I've gone through in my own life and family stuff, the fact that they commented that the plague that wiped out the Philosians or most of them was Staphylococcus. Yes. I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, and the yeah. fact that I felt very much like this scene, you know, I, I, I can't quite place whether this, whether the scene with them in the corridor is before the pterodactyls or after the pterodactyls. Um, the pterodactyls appear twice in the episode, so it's in, in between it. Okay. This is the best way to say it. So yeah, so there was a scene which I'm gonna put on the put on the screen so that people can see is basically mm -hmm. um how we, we kind of get the scene where they're walking through and they you can see the the ancestors of yep. the, the 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 aliens that we that are walking around. Um and they're basically going through that these these ancestors were basically killed by humanoids that came to the planet many years ago and mm -hmm. gave them diseases that they couldn't fight and i felt that was so intriguing because it kind of it's happened in on our planet where we've had you know people from countries go into other countries and giving the native people that live there um or indigenous indigenous people apologies um indigenous, indigenous sorry that's, i can't pronounce yep. that indigenous um yep. people diseases because they couldn't combat yes. them? What I, what I do find interesting, though, is that staph is one of those infections that actually can carry from animals onto plants and plants onto animals. Yes. So the fact that they comment on it being that kind of an infection, I found it, like, you know, very interesting. And it, it caught me at that moment. Because, uh, like I said, family stuff, I was dealing with that with a family member right when this was on, right when I was watching this. And yeah, the plague wiped out the people. But what I liked about that moment when they brought it up was that recognizing that they had still just saved Sulu. Yeah. And okay, yeah, they kidnapped Spock or, or were about to. No, they, they had already kidnapped Spock and so on, but they don't seem angry about it. Like, they're big hearted enough to recognize that it wasn't, oh, people came here and infected us with this disease and now we want to kill everyone. No, it's people came here, we didn't realize a disease got loose. It became a plague before we could cure it. Yeah. And here we sit. Yeah, and, just, and the imagery is just it's it's yes. it's sad, but it's so beautiful. Obviously, you've got you've got these massive, mm -hmm. massive creatures, and they've got cobwebs over them, dust, and you can just see that you know within within a couple of years they're probably going to you know fade to dust, but they're they're kind of standards. It's almost as if like they're a century over these corridors yeah. and I just the imagery I just I found it astounding that they were able to achieve that with with um animation you know in the 70s it was just it was really good I just love it yeah it, it was great animation um now moving up because we've already seen Spock get kidnapped um it's this is the second time beam us up Scotty comes up yes and this time it's a little bit more uh defeated 
than the than the first time back in Lorelei signal. Uh, Uhura is on the bridge rather than Morass. I don't mind that. Yeah, I like that. Um, and now because of the mention from the Philosians of Doctor Caniclius, their leader, they look him up. Yeah. And this is the first story of the origins of the eugenics wars. Rather than uh, Dr. Sung, who I think Enterprise and a few others try to blame for it. Yeah. Um, it's this Dr. Caniclius, who is the engineer behind uh, the genetic Superman that Khan would be one of and that his idea was to create them to have peace yeah. and you know have them spread peace and understanding and so on through the galaxy and you kind of see that you know if that was what Roddenberry was thinking back in 67 you kind of see that in Space Seed where Montalban's con is suave and cool and collected and not a bad person initially until he stops getting his way. And that's kind of the thing that we see in this episode as well. Mm -hmm. um, as long as Caniclius is getting his way, yes. go do as you will. Yes. Yes. The moment that stops happening, we have a problem. Yes, I found this quite, um, it kind of intrigued me ever so slightly because obviously I don't have as much lore in my head around the eugenics war and all of this. We've not mm -hmm. seen a lot of the original series and all of this, yep. but I just found it very, um, yeah, it, it kind of, it kind of, sprung up on me that I was like oh okay this did this is not what I expected from this episode I very much did not expect mm -hmm. that we would have the eugenics war on a planet with plants as the aliens um and I really <laughs> really like it I like yeah. that it kind of it threw me for a spin um well, it wasn't what I expected and then I very much did not expect um, him to be basically a giant. <laughs> yeah, that that's the one that throws everybody, yeah, that I think, kind of including funny. me. But what I found quite funny is the how they kind of did this, even though they didn't really need to do it. I felt they they kind of did it, and I, I've just put it up on the screen. Is if obviously when you see Caniclus, he is very much you kind of look up at him. Yes, and the I, camera work is great in that hey, scene. I feel like, you know, even though they didn't need to do the camera work, they very much do do the camera work for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it that... It makes every, it so much better. Yeah, every episode that I've, I've, I've obviously watched so far, there is something about the camera work that I really, really enjoy. And yeah. it, it throws me because you don't expect it in a cartoon. See, I kind of do, especially in a filmation cartoon, because they were doing paintings. And a lot of these guys also came from cinema. So you've got cinematic people bringing paintings in that art style yeah. to cartoons. Yeah. And this wasn't just throw it out there for the kids either. This is, this is Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I would, be, I, I would expect as someone watching it in 2024, that there would be, that much thought put into a cartoon that they've got the camera mm -hmm. work or you know yeah. but even obviously when we eventually find out what happens to spock that's still the same style mm -hmm. um yes and it's just yeah it's 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 good and obviously as this episode goes on we find that spock has where well, he has no brain that's I well think that's it's way. it's once again Hello, Spock's brain. Yes. We've we've missed you. Oh wait, no, we haven't. You're the worst episode of the original series. Yeah. But this is a if this had been the original plan for Spock's brain, this would have been that would have been a much better episode. Um, because you haven't watched Spock's brain yet. No, I haven't. I haven't had that pleasure, but I've 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 heard You should. It's it's funny. 
it, it's one of those where I would almost suggest don't watch it sober. <laughs> because if you watch it sober as a Trekkie, you will be going, no, no, no that's not I, how any of this... That's I, not do how this any, I do that anyway. Hmm? But I do that anyway with the animated series, so maybe I do need to... Uh, yeah. I, I need well, to, with, I need to drive. with the animated series, at least it, it tends to work within its own logic. Mm, okay. Tends to. But yeah, so then um, we, we kind of move on to us meeting the fact that meeting well, Spock 2. Actually, I do want to jump in before we get to Spock 2. Okay. One comment, as they're running down the tunnel, these plant tunnels are 600 times denser than lead. Holy cannoli. That's that's a lot. They should make starship plating out of that stuff. I do I do have something that I've put in my notes. As they're going along this corridor, they've got belt lights. I love that. Yes. Oh the number of little things they do like that. Yeah. Why don't we still do them in track? Yeah, no, I love belt lights. I think that's genius. Why have we exactly. done that before? But yes, so we meet Spock Two, who Spock is two, yep. Who is a giant, basically. He is a right. giant, and he has the brain of Spock. Yes. And he's he stays silent at first, which I like. The fact that he just kind of stands there, he's like, this is illogical, you know? And, and you can almost see, with the way they do the facial expressions, which yes. are somewhat limited. Yes. Because it's but you can almost see in his head, this is highly illogical, and I have no idea what I'm going to do about it. Yes, yes. He's very much... Because he's trying to absorb, you know, not only himself as an entity, yeah. but also all of Spock. Yeah. Now, this is before the idea of the Katra happened. Yeah. So, given later shows, Spock's Katra is still in his body. Yes, yes. Which but should... his brain, or his mind, has been transferred out. Yes, and obviously Caniculus says, "Oh well, I, I can't, I can't keep both both of them alive because I can't, I can't right. copy copy the brain, basically." Right. But then we get the scene, which I think is my favorite part of this whole episode, and how they were and Scotty arguing. No, 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 no! It's oh. how they use. I don't. When when it comes up. I, I am so happy. Though there are two small things before that. Okay. One on the on the bridge of the Enterprise, Uhura and Scotty are trying to talk about okay, how do we get communications to them? How do we beam them out? How do we you know, how do we save our friends? Yeah. And she's arguing the technical side. Yes. To him on equal footing. And I really love that. Yeah. It's one of those things about the character development of Uhura in the animated series. And I don't want that to go unremarked. No. It because definitely needs remarked. she I'd, deserves it. I'd forgotten that scene. But yes, it's... Yeah. it's yeah. My, girl, my girl is holding her own. Let's put it this way. Exactly. And, yes. And exactly. I feel and it's, it's definitely leaning toward her appearances in the movies. Um, where she does take on a more technical role. Until she, until Kirk decides, hey, I'm still in a ship. She's like, yep, okay. Jim Kirk's in command. I'm there. Yeah. Because <clears throat> yeah. that's who she is. Uh, the other thing, in Caniculus's speech, we get the first mention in Star Trek of the Kazinti. Yes. Who will show up later, hint, hint. Uh, yes, these are Larry Niven's Kazinti. Yes, he did work with the animated series. No, you don't need to have read all the Man Kazin War books to understand what's going on. Uh, which is good. <laughs> but, um, the other thing is, I love that when he's talking about the Kazinti and the Galactic War, which is actually the Earth-Romulan War. Yeah. When he's talking about 
the eugenics wars yeah. that he started. Um, and he's that far out of date. Yes. You know, it's like, why didn't you just look around? Yeah. There's literally communications everywhere. There's a news network. It exists already by this time. We know this. There's public information. Um, yeah. And I did he's, he's kind of love the... Yeah. And the idea of imposing peace. Kind of a contradiction in terms there. Yes. Yes. But um, the other thing is that I liked when, you know, Kirk comments on, you know, Idik and so on, and gives this really good impassioned speech about how there's mostly peace now. Yes. And we don't need to be violent. You know, going back to his uh, comment that he had made back in an episode of TOS that we will not kill yes. today is the first statement of civilization. Um, when Spock 2, having come to now and recognizing what's going on, and having talked to her and basically reassured her that everything's okay, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Doesn't even tell her that he's not the original Spock. It's it's the way he kind of pokes. <laughs> pokes the yes, communicator. when he pokes the communicator, it's great. Yeah, it's, it's just so but, good imagery. Yes, but he's you know he's still Spock. Yes, and actually says to Kirk. would be illogical to invalidate what you your impassioned speech before with violence. Yeah. Stop. Yes. You know? It's like oh shit he's right. <laughs> yeah, I you know I really love the ending of this episode, how they use IDIC and you know, for anyone who exactly. isn't aware of what IDIC is, it's basically it's an acronym for infinite diversity infinite and diversity. infinite combinations. And it's yep. the basis of Vulcan philosophy. Um, yep. you know, it's the of... circle and triangle symbol also yeah. that uh, Spock has worn occasionally, especially in I think Journey to Babylon and a few of the others. Um it became less uh, visual over time. Yeah. So, but it is part of Vulcan iconography. Yes. Uh, up until DS9, I don't know. Well, actually, no, into Voyager, because Tuvok had an Idic logo as well in his quarters. Yeah, and obviously it basically represents... Um, and celebrates the vast array of variables in the universe, which I just, I love. Yeah. And how they use it in this episode is just beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think this is actually my favorite ending of an episode because of how yeah. it ends with the fact that both Spock and Spock 2 are alive. Um, yes. And the fact that Spock 2 and Caniclus 4 are going to work together. No, Caniclus 5. Caniclus 5, is he? Yeah, he's 5, yeah. Okay. Um, they're going to work together um, to try and help. Yep. And I think it's just, it's yeah. the most it's satisfying a... end of an episode. Yeah. Well, actually, honestly, I, I get where you're coming from. I, the ending is one of the things that makes me glad that animated series is not canon. Because I want you to realize if after Star Trek 2, Right, Spock has sacrificed himself to save the ship. They wouldn't have needed to go through the nonsense of Sarek coming to Kirk. Yes, Sarek going, you know, them finding McCoy. You know, they would have had to go to the Genesis planet, but they could have just contacted Phylos and said, "Hey, uh, Spock, too." We need your help. Mm -hmm. Your original is dead. Yeah. And we don't it know what to do about it. It was at that point. And I think... I, I think and I'm kind was, of glad for that. Yeah, I kind of think it wasn't canon at that point because they wanted... 
the plot to go how they wanted it. Yeah, also, think about this. How unsatisfying would Star Trek Three have been if all they had to do was make a phone call? Yeah, it wouldn't have been quite the same. It's all right. I'm still having right. I'm still having technical difficulties where I've set my new desk up and my, my light doesn't want to stay where it's meant to do. So Oh no, I hate that. I've seen it kind of I've, play through a couple of times. Yes. It's um, it's been tip it's been wibbling wobbling, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry folks. We, I've I've moved things around and it's it's, good. we're still not quite there. We will be there hopefully for we'll next be, episode. We'll be there. <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Yes. So what is yeah. your score for this episode? This one, I gave it a score of three Giant Spox out of five. How did you know it was Giant Spox? <laughs> because like, there's only one thing from this episode that matters. The Giant Spox. Okay. I'm, I'm um, getting obvious. I'm getting obvious. Yes, it is Giant Spox. And I've actually given it a similar score. Um, Though I love the imagery, I love the story, I love how... We get the um, we get the callbacks to different points in our history. Mm -hmm. I still felt it was lacking in something, but I don't know what it was. Um, so um, I've I've given it a free as yeah. well, um, but I, we, I don't know why. I don't know why it's got such a low score because I do feel it possibly well, deserved more. I think part of it for me is that this one and a couple of other episodes in animated series, including the one we're about to go into, are sort of redemption episodes. Mm. That's kind of the idea. But in this case, it's not earned. Yeah. Caniclius, we don't know what he did before for which he needed to redeem himself. Yeah. And technically, the being who needed redemption was dead four generations ago. Yeah. Because, you know, it was Caniclius one, you know, the original, who came to Phylos and spread the infection by mistake. Yeah. It wasn't this guy. Yeah. This guy is just an idiot. <laughs> yeah. You know, a well-intentioned idiot. Yes. Probably yeah. a very smart idiot. Yeah. But he was an idiot. And so he doesn't need that redemption that we give him. Yeah. Through the episode. And the Philosians also, they don't need redemption for their idea of launching a fleet to help bring peace. Yes. Because A, they didn't do it. B, they had good goals. They didn't need you know, the the tone is redemption, but we don't see the actions to be redeemed from yeah. or hear them. Um, something kind of along that line in the original series, uh, an episode, The Conscience of the King. Yeah. Where we find the guy who was the governor of Tarsus IV during plague. We hear what he decreed. We know the effect of it on Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Riley and others. We know that murders have happened, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Yeah. and we see that the man, you know, is what he is. Yeah. Um. At some point, you should watch that episode. Yeah, I think I but, am. But yes, but moving on to the next yes. episode. The next episode. Oh Lord, this is. Yeah. This is one of them. Oh boy. Okay. The Magics of Megas 2. I have been looking forward to this episode for so long because... And I... I'm glad you're looking forward to it because I have been... Because this is one where, as I said, I've watched the animated series through two or three times. Yeah. This is one of the ones that I skip sometimes. Yes. And it's there's a bunch of reasons why. And I'm going to start with the one right up at the top. Okay. Stardate 1254.4. That puts it before the original pilot where no man has gone before uh, see, on I, Stardate 13.4. I, I don't listen to the Stardates. I don't think they knew what they were doing. 
they and the problem is that up until now, literally up until now, they've been okay. They've been fifty five hundred or something like that. Kind of indicating that this is the fifth mission year or the fourth mission year for the Enterprise. This episode with Lieutenant Arix in it takes place before the first episode. See, I just started. Yet, started it can't work unless- to me. Started mean nothing to me. It's why I don't. Okay. I don't use them on my on my games because I think they're silly. I think you know. Okay. Yeah. All so right. I, I understand. Yeah. So I think, but I, I, I know you've got a couple more reasons, but I kind of feel like I need to before I durst explain my oh. reason for being so excited about this episode. So Please go, go. I have a really bad habit on SS Mary Rose of using points from the original series and never having watched the original series or the animated series. <laughs> So I have basically, I have a character who is roaming the universe, who is actually from this program. Um, She is part of the species that we are going to see in this episode. I have never seen this episode, okay, until yesterday. But I really enjoyed the concept of these aliens. Aliens. Um, I really wanted to use them. So I've been putting off watching this episode, but I'm really glad I did. And we are be- probably going to have a big difference of opinion on this episode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Yes. So, um, but, go on, I- I'm going to... That. That your, your reasons. No, I've got my reasons out of the way. Well, I also want to go into one thing. Um, kind of a note. I think I actually put this kind of into our, our chat before. Uh, but... Um, this episode took place on the 20 year anniversary of the crucible by Arthur Miller. Miller had put it on stage in 53. It was made into, a, it got a best play Tony. It was made into a movie by none less than Sartre in 57. Uh, Robert Ward turned it into an opera in 62 and then CBS in 68 put it on uh, their Playhouse series. That's okay. just a few years before this. And given that Roddenberry was very much in his pro-communism phase at this point, uh, references to that, uh, you know, the play where they skewer McCarthyism through the lens of the Salem witch trials. Okay. Uh, it, it can definitely be understood that teenagers in the seventies knew what the crucible was. It was already kind of becoming standard reading in high schools and it had been on TV. It was on stage. It was, it was around. I do feel like this episode is very, very I don't want to say Americanized, um, but I feel it, it, it absolutely it would, is. Yeah, I feel very much that it would be you would respond to it better being an American. Um, just because, and yet I find that you have the much better response to it. Yes, but that's because I'm I'm a bit kooky and a bit yeah. I I like this episode because it's yeah, yeah. it appeals to me more. But I yeah. feel very much like. It's it's an American episode. It's got a lot of American history, yeah. even though it does explore um, a more world view. Um, well, it gets it, it yeah. Get a, this is another redemption yeah, episode. Just to go yeah, into it, it does get a little bit controversial, which I find a very <laughs> intriguing part because of when it was broadcast. Because the seven. One of my big notes is how the episode got away without thousands of angry letters yes. from evangelicals and other religious people. I think we need to get into I genuinely do yes. not know. Yes. Um I think we definitely need to get into this episode that basically how it starts is that they're they're at the edge of the universe or the center of the universe. Galactic center again. Okay. So they're there. They get you know we're 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 there for Star Trek five. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait. Yes, yes. Oh, in the middle of the galaxy in Star Trek five? The guy who thinks he's God? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
So We're about to run into that, aren't we? They're they're in the center of the galaxy, and suddenly they get pulled into what's what's they call it? They get I would say they just get pulled into a, I don't want to say a wormhole. A, a vor okay. No, it's a vortex. Vortex. They get pulled into a vortex and, where and I again I love the animation on the ship. Every time it comes up, every time they make a new animation frame for the ship, I love it. It is one of the best things about filmation style that it works well for vehicles and for architecture and you're having an argument with your light. Oh, geez, yes, I've had to I've had to turn it off. So we will you'll have to just see mm -hmm. me ever so slightly in the dark now because it doesn't want to stay yes. there. I've lent it against the wall, well, I've moved it around, and I think it's better if we just if we just forget it for now. Yes. <laughs> Next yes. time it will okay. be prepared. Um it, the imagery yeah. on this the, at the beginning with the ship and going into the vortex. Yep. It's so yep. good. You know, we kind of get it really is. Yes, it, it wouldn't have been able to be done with the no, technology that's, from the 70s. It's, it's another one of those, they couldn't do it in live action, and I'm very glad that they did it here in some ways. Yes. Um, I'm, the episode deserves better than what it gets for me. Yes, yes. Um, um, I've got a, I've got a couple I've got a couple of notes that I've I've got I've got one about bones. I feel like I'm I'm slightly picking on him this episode of our review because go for I think I'm like well why does he why is he just left sick though why is he on the bridge that is not his duty station surely no but like I've said there are many times that we see him throughout both this series and the original series yeah. where he just is a gadfly on the bridge. He really is, and I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say I don't like it, and I, I don't want to pick on him because I think Bones is, is an intriguing character. But I'm like, but that, that wouldn't fly on any of a series, surely? Him just wandering up from his duty station onto the bridge. Mm, no, Bev spent time on the bridge. But it, but it wasn't every episode. She didn't just wander onto the bridge willy nilly and just, just, just appear. Well, she also wasn't okay. The thing with the original series is Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are the driving yeah. figures, especially now that we're in the animated series. They are the driving figures. Uh, Scotty gets moments. Uhura gets awesome moments. Yeah. Um, but our base for the episode and our moral center is going is is based on Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Yeah. You know the id, the ego. It just, it just ever so. Well, slightly, it just ever it's so. It's actually the super ego, the ego, and the id. Yes, it just ever so slightly bugs me that he just appears on the bridge. But mm. I do, I do like the fact he's there for this episode because obviously, once yes. they're in the vortex, and nothing on the ship is working. You know, they they don't have life support, yep. they don't have battery, they don't have propulsion. Literally, everything is going off, and then this being appears. A stator. Yes, which I w I have a picture of, which I'm gonna I'm gonna show everyone. Okay. Haven't seen it. Well, which I absolutely love because he has absolute pecs of steel, like the muscles <laughs> showing on this oh, yes. character are amazing. Like, how did they get away with that in the seventies? This is what I want to know. Well, he's a satyr, so I mean. Given what satyrs are known to do in mythology, a lot of, <laughs> uh, give you a hint, it's them and rabbits. Uh, <laughs> but it was just, I was like, he would have to be buff. I was like, oh my god, like Lucian, isn't it? Obviously, we find out his name is Lucian. Yeah. Um, yep. I, was like, Lucian yeah. I was like, hang on a minute, how did they get away with this? This episode, I feel <laughs> very much like it's the most controversial episode, and I am here for it. Mm -hmm. I am so here okay. for this episode. <laughs> Where for me, I, I look at it and I'm like, okay, it's the satyr. His name is Lucian. Oh, goody. I know where this is going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, just... I've played Shin Megami Tensei. I know where this is going. Yes. <sighs> and obviously, Lucian um, takes um, Spock, McCoy, and Kirk to his planet. And yes. I Megas 2. Yep. Megas 2. I absolutely love this because, yet again, the imagery is just stunning. We have that very soft, soft glow, mm -hmm. soft glow around everybody. And it's just, yeah. it, remi it reminded me of the soft glow that we saw um, in, what episode was it? Um, 
What, beyond the farthest star where they had the life belts? Uh, or... It might have been. No, no, no. The, um, it was actually in the um, the original series. It was hmm. uh, City on the Edge of Tomorrow. The city oh, City on the Edge of Forever when Forever. they put Vaseline on the camera yeah, yeah, yeah. for uh, Eve Keeler, yes. Yes, it reminded me of that. Even though it wasn't for the same yeah. reason, it very much reminded me of that imagery. Um, and then obviously we find out that this planet doesn't have the rules that we expect. It basically runs on magic. Right, which um, there are two things about that. One that I think is a negative and one that I think is a positive. Yeah. The first one, I loathe in sci-fi, in fantasy, in any fiction, the, oh, we're so much better than you, but we'll translate our world into symbols your minds can understand. Yes. No. Yes. No. No. Our minds can understand a heck of a lot more than you think, buddy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I, I mean, where it's a cop out. The, the the Q continuum makes sense because it's you know the energy yes. they're technically energy beings that then take on bodies. Yeah. Fine. So they show us that you know by translating us up to their plane, they show us their interpretation of it. Yeah. Fine. Uh but I hate that symbols your mind can understand phrase, and I hate. The implications of it, yeah. but I, but coming right after that, um, the other person who seems galled by that, the fact that Spock is the one who figures out all magic is is sufficient is insufficiently explained science. Yes, yes, and I think the fact that Spock is the one who does all of this, and yes. he's the one who later on realizes that they can do magic because the rules apply to them as well exactly i think that was the best move i think if anyone else had yes. just had done that we would be like mm, not quite a good character um character move but the fact that it's, it's i think the, it's the only other one that could have done it would have been uhura yeah because she's already been explained as being you know we've seen her do weird stuff Yes, yeah. And we've seen her be open to more things. But yeah, Spock being the one who figures out it does work on scientific rules. Yes. It's just a different paradigm. Yes. And starts doing the magic, which <gasps> I liked. Which brings up, oh, this is my favorite part, other than something that happens later on. It is yeah. another Hell Spock moment. Yeah. Yes. Oh, definitely. The whole episode is, is a hail spark. He does another hail spark. And for anyone who doesn't know this, because this has been d decided that it's been one of a lot of people's favorite moments so far, is where I've called this hail spark. That basically he is like this. Yep. Um, and that's when he is obviously doing the telekinesis when he moves um, the chess pieces around. Um, but yes. Yeah. I love the Hell Spock, and I will forever be searching for Hell Spock moments because I think the genius and yeah. they're my favorite thing out of the animated series, other than <laughs> yes. So yes, where my favorite things out of the animated series are the ship designs. Yes, yes, yes. So, we, but we yeah, have, we have um, favorite things. But yeah, you know the fact. That what I find interesting next when we get into the uh, trial. Yes. There's there's a lot going on here, and this is where the Crucible references really start hitting home, okay. because this is when we start getting into the Salem Witch Trial yep. references more directly. Yes. Uh, when they actually comment on having been kicked out of Salem. Yes, which I find which really, I find I, I I hate the fact that I keep saying I find it interesting, but I do. I think I'm very much on an interesting journey with this. I think yeah. it's, it's really. They thought a lot about this episode and the fact that they have linked it yeah. to so many things. They've linked it to the Salem witch trials and they've got they've got facts that are very specific and they have they have delved into it. They've yes. done a lot of research. You know, we find out the Megans yes. that traveled to Earth thousands of years ago. Um, they have been part mm -hmm. of Earth's development. Um, they are an ageless species. Um, we find out that they've had impacts on religion. 
Mm -hmm. Well, they, given that their names are the names of demons yes. in the Judeo-Christian faith, because you notice, by the way, um, the main guy standing inside a pentagram who we never see leave that pentagram. Yes. Uh, Asmodeus is a name which is used for either the devil or, or other chiefs of demons. Yes. In addition, of course, to Lucian yes. being, you know, we know who he is. Yes. I've put, um, I've put up on the screen an image so that people can see how the trial looks. You know, you've got the pentagram, mm -hmm. you've got people in um, stocks, you've got yep. you know, the Meg the Mega Megans are dressed as Puritans. Um, yep. Yeah, it's they have got a lot of facts and, right, and they've done. They've done and in that. fact, the Puritan design that they're using there uh, does reference the CBS version of. Uh, uh, the Crucible. Mm -hmm. Those are basically drawn versions of those same costumes. Mm -hmm. um, and what I find also interesting about everybody who's in stocks, it's not just Kirk. It's not just... It's the whole crew. Yeah, it's, it's the whole crew. And we see Arix in stocks as well. So it's not just... So, in a sense... While, yes, they're angry at Earth, they take it out on everybody. And that's one of the points where, the if I was not already soured on the Megans, where it would have gone even further to me. Yes, yes. And I, I, can, but, I can understand why a lot of people don't think of this as a good episode, but it appeals to mm -hmm. me. You know, I, I'm, very much, I'm, I'm very much into... And I'm glad for that. I'm very much into history. I'm very much into... Mm -hmm. Um, witchy stuff. Um, I very much love this episode and yep. the Megans. No. I very much do love it. But I can understand there was only one point that I really, really thought what the actual is going on here. And that is Kirk and the magic battle. What the actual the magic battle. What what <laughs> what Yeah. I... On the other hand, there are two things from Kirk or about Kirk in this episode that I liked. This is the first time when Kirk's middle name gets given as Tiberius. It's the first time he's James T. Kirk. Yes. Because the two times that we had seen it in the original series, he was James R. Kirk. Okay. So I actually like it. This is the first time he becomes James T. Kirk. Yeah. And I like that before the magic battle, before the before that that Kirk highlights the prime directive and name drops it. Yes. Yes. It's not just we have a general order against involvement in yes. other life forms. It's not just our first rule, you know, our first law is. It's this is our prime directive. And and giving that name again. And it's again this is one of those things where there's the continuity coming back. Yeah, and I feel very much like it did have a lot of those aspects. Even though it's not a good episode to a lot of people, it did have very much... Yeah. It, it's another one added to the lore. Um, and oh, yeah. We've got, um, we've got Lucian yeah. being punished. It deserves better. Yeah, we've got, obviously, Lucian being punished because he bought the ship to Megas 2. Um, yep. And I think this episode actually highlights the best of Starfleet as well. Why I like it is because, yes, I'm not the best fan of Kirk, but the fact he did stand up for Lucian and he did, you know, he did delve into his compassion and all of this. That's that's I, the best moments of Kirk. Yes, though I don't like the magic battle, I do think no. it was a very good character builder moment for him um yes yes the magic battle was the point where i nearly um turned over but i'm very glad that the, <laughs> the miggins didn't um weren't actually going to punish lucian they were only testing humanity um and i like the fact that humanity has changed since yes time. and of course this is another that's another reason why i'm not a huge fan of this episode 
there's only one episode. Well, technically it's four, but two, maybe, where I like the idea of humanity on trial. Yes. Far point and all good things. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why do I like them? Because I like Q. Yeah. You know, John Delancey earns it. <laughs> I almost wonder. Every other time the humanity is on trial. I just. The Megans were a precursor to the Q. In a sense, yes. Uh, though, actually, I, I think they're more related to Adonis. Okay. Because, remember, in TOS, they literally meet Adonis as well. I haven't seen it. You need to. Uh, <laughs> oh, and also, this is not their first encounter with magic, either. Okay. Cat's paw. I haven't seen that, either. I've literally I've seen four episodes. See, we need... Okay. This is the thing. You and I need to go through the original series. Because where you and... Was that Emu that you went through with? You and Emu had not seen the original series. And kind of didn't have that expectation. You also came into it from... A perspective of not liking it initially... I think now that you've seen the animated series and seen the best of what Star Trek can be Maybe. At, in this era, that the original series might take a bit more of a shine. Maybe. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But yes. So what is your score for this episode? I would say it's a one one and a half loosens out of five, but it's really one. Okay. It is a one out of five, I really and and I know that I'm grading it low. I know that I'm being unfair, but I just I don't. There's so much about this episode where it deserves better, and there's so much about this episode where it doesn't do, where it doesn't hit the right notes immediately. Um, it was originally going to be a two out of five okay. for me, but I just, the magic battle gets me, the humanity on trial gets me, the symbols your mind can understand yeah. gets under my skin. Um, and it doesn't override the fact that yes, it's the first time we see the name James T. Kirk or hear the name James T. Kirk. It's. It, it overrides the prime directive being highlighted. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say the Galactic Center is where Star Trek goes to get weird and bad. Yeah. That's that's it. Because yeah. Star Trek V does it, this does it, and a few others do it as well. It's just, it's a mess. But, you know, on a more funny note, I would have actually rated this please allow me to introduce myself i'm a man of wealth and taste out of five <clears throat> right my score but what's yours my score is going to be three okay because i i do like this episode i very much do um for the reasons that i've said you know one it's it's always had a little bit of a little bit of um i've i've always i've always liked this episode even though i've never seen it i've always liked it because i've liked the concept of it but the things that i do like one it's an amazing episode for the 70s how with the fact that it's got so many references to the Bible and the fact that Lucian is basically, he, they, they, they basically say on screen, he, he was known on earth as Lucius, Lucifer, sorry, Lucifer. Yep. As Lucifer, as the devil. Yep. Yeah. They, they I, flat out say. I do not know, but as I said earlier, I'm here for this episode because it is so controversial. I do love a good episode like this. Um, I, apart from the magic battle, <laughs> which was just yeah. ridiculous um yes. the imagery was amazing um some of the aspects of it you know the, the fact it goes into so much human lore um it goes into mythology it there is just so much about this episode that i do love um i probably could have raised it higher 
um but i don't necessarily think it is as good an episode as um what's, what was the vulcan one that we did uh yesteryear infinite yeah, vulcan it's, it's, it's yeah, no well yesteryear there's a reason i gave it six out of five yeah. yesteryear is i think one of the best episodes of all of star trek yeah just right off the bat it's, it's very much nowhere near that so it, it it can obviously have as much as that but it is a good yeah. episode in my opinion um do I want to see more of the more of them? Yes, I do want to see more of the Megans because I think they're genius, and I think they should come back, um, in the lower decks. I would love to see Boimer and um Beckett meet them. I think that would be a brilliant episode. Mm -hmm. You have no idea because I don't think you've seen the lower decks, have you? No, I have not. Oh my god, you're missing out. You are missing oh, out so much. Lower decks. A lot of what I've heard of it. The problem is that for me, a lot of what I've heard about Lower Decks gives me the impression that I would feel like you do about TOS. It's a couple a love, of high moments. It's a, love, and... it's a love story to Star Trek. It really is a love story. Okay. It is done by people who love Star Trek. There, I, I can understand why some people okay. do not see seem to like it because there are moments mm -hmm. where you think, oh my god, what, what the actual? But it is so funny. It literally has mm -hmm. me creased. I have actually fallen okay. off the sofa laughing because it was so funny. I'll have to look it up then. I would, I would have a look. There are some no moments that you, it, it, you feel like it's taking the piss, but it, it, yeah. it, really, it really isn't. It is. It's doing it in such a way that you, you just can't, can't help but think it's a love letter to. Okay. Um, to Star Trek, but yes. So the next two episodes, what what do I have in store with the next two episodes? Then, Andy, let me. Know. Ah, the next two episodes are sequels to episodes that you haven't seen yet, unfortunately. Okay. But they are sequels to great episodes. Okay. Um, I don't really want to spoil them too much. Okay. But I will say that in the second episode of what we're going to cover next. It's a return of a character who... Is it mud? I think... Hmm? Is it mud? Yes. yes. Get in, I love mud. Okay, good. You have... Discovery, I love him. I love him in Discovery. Oh, see, no, this is this is kind of his TOS persona. Yeah, but I, original... I, I, I still love it. Mud is just a genius okay. character. I love it, so yeah. But, yes, but, oh, this, but that mud episode, you're going to love it, and it is absolutely a return to form for Harcourt Fett and Mud. Okay. Um the the next episode though uh as I said it's a return to uh another to a planet that we saw in TOS. Okay. Um and actually it's a sequel that's not handled by the people who wrote the original episode. So I'll, I'll just leave you with a hint uh, that I'm late. I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. Okay. Right. All right. Hmm. So but yes, I think we'll leave that there for now. Um, yep. And we'll Let's leave it there. All next time. Take care. Keep writing. Bye. Yep. And always like, comment, subscribe. We always appreciate your comments yes. on the two episodes we just discussed. Uh, do you disagree with me about Magics of Megas 2? Do you know anything about the response to it publicly? Are you interested in this? Uh, you know, and also with the Infinite Vulcan, we kind of both went three out of five there. Uh, do you agree with us? You know, is that is it a middle of the road episode to you with a giant Spock in it? Yeah, giant Spock. And what would you do with that in a fan fiction? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh my goodness! I can imagine what people would do with giant Spock in a fan fiction. Oh my goodness! I know exactly what they would do, and it involves Christine Chapel. Oh wait, we'll get into that in two episodes. Oh god! Right on that note, I definitely <laughs> think it's it's time to go. Bye. Yes. With that. Yes.